Hello, hello students. Welcome to the last part of this chapter, Assessment of the Nervous System, part three. So in whatever is related to the laboratory assessment, um, we are going to consider the fluid, the electrolytes, glucose abnormalities. We are going to pay attention to the basic metabolic panel, which includes your liver um, enzymes, uh, your kidney function, your serum, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, all these um, different factors that are going to be reported in the results of the classic basic metabolic panel. Uh, anemia and malnutrition also are going to be assessed and also we're going to check our complete blood count um, uh, which includes our uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets and also serum levels of uh, albumin, prealbumin, minerals, vitamins, particularly B vitamins that we mentioned in the previous part okay so for patients with um, infections we need to go ahead and take cultures uh, to be studied and um, especially if they are having cns disease and we have to consider the blood brain barrier if it's affected or no and because this could develop uh, into meningitis or encephalitis or could be the cause of meningitis or encephalitis right so the blood brain barrier is very important um, let's go to the imaging assessment under the umbrella under the umbrella of radiography, we have the plain X-rays of the skull and spine that are used to determine bony fractures, curvatures, bony erosion, bone dislocation, and possible calcifications of soft tissue, which can damage the nervous system. So, if we have, if you see bony degenerations in the spine, this can compress the nerves and cause problems, right? In head trauma and multiple injuries, after assessing the ABCs, the airway, breathing, and circulation, one of the first priorities is to rule out cervical spine fracture, is to determine any relationship with the cervical spine fracture. The CT scanning in, is another type of uh, radiography imaging. Um, it's a scanning, uh, a scanning is accurate, quick, easy, non-invasive, painless, and the least expensive method of diagnosing neurologic problems. Having said that, when we want to order, or the doctor wants to order an MRI as a first imaging, then many insurance, and I would say most of them, they are going to see if the X-ray and CT scan were done first in order to approve the MRI. So MRI is going to be difficult to approve if there is no previous report, there's no previous X-ray, previous CT scan. Okay, um, in the CT scan, they are using X-rays. Pictures are taken at many horizontal levels or slice, slices uh, of the brain and spinal cord. A contrast medium may be used to enhance the image. CT scan distinguish bone from soft tissue, the brain vascular system and ventricular system. This is good to know is NCLEX material alert, okay? And they are going to present you with cases. The patient is presenting with these conditions, this, this, and this. What test is suggested for uh, diagnostic or for better assessment? And they're going to give you, right? CT scan, MRI, PET scan, X-ray, and you need to identify which one is the, the, the best one. Uh, the CT scans and fluids such as cerebrospinal fluid. Um, so they are going, this is, test is going to be able to analyze that uh, and the blood. 
Tumors, infarctions, hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, and bone malformations can also be identified. Okay, so remember CT scans distinguish bones of tissues and all other factors here. Okay, please remember that NCLEX material. So the contrasted the contrast in hay ct is especially useful in locating and identifying tumor types and abscesses for situations in which bleeding is the only concern for example a, tra a trauma patient contrast scans are not usually required okay now let's go to the third type is CT angiography involves administering contracts dye IV before the CT scan. It is used to identify blockages or narrowing of blood vessels, aneurysm, and other blood vessel abnormalities. A CT perfusion study is an important tool in the evaluation of patients with acute stroke-like symptom. And I am just giving a brief explanation about this test because we are going to focus um, more um, in more detail in those that requires nursing care pre and post procedure. Okay, um, let me talk about the intrathecal constraint in hay CT. A scan is performed to diagnose disorders of the spine and spinal nerve roots. A lumbar puncture is performed so that a small amount of spinal fluid can be removed and mixed with contrast dye and injected. The patient may be may have a headache after the procedure. This is another nursing care alert you are supposed to tell the patient about the intrathecal contrast in hay CT scan that headache will be present after the procedure. So this is an NCLEX examination question. The nurse assesses a non-responsive client using a Glasgow Coma Scale and determines the client total score is six. So how would the nurse interpret this? And of course, based on the score is comatose. Okay, magnetic resonance imaging which is your MRI. The magnetic resonance has advantages over the CT in the diagnostic imaging of the brain, spinal cord, and nerve roots. So usually when you have a patient presenting in the hospital with any type of facial paralysis or so problem in the ocular uh, movements, um, the hospital is not going to follow the protocol, you know, first the x-ray, then the CT scan, then we're going to know. Depending on the presentation, this is an inpatient setting and it's a hospital, so care must be done um, faster. So they are going to go straight to the MRI. If we are talking about outpatient, that's another story. Okay, um, so it does not use ionizing radiation, but instead relies on magnetic fields. So that's the big difference between the radiographic um, images, okay? Uh, they are using um, amount of radiation, a certain amount of radiation versus MRIs, they don't use radiation. What they use is magnetic fields. Images may be in case with the use of gadolinium. Okay, that's another difference versus the CT scan that they are using some um, other fluids uh, that are... Um, probably causing a allergic reactions in patients. The MRI uses gadolinium, a non-iodine-based contrast, contrast medium. Mm, bony structures cannot be viewed with MRI. CT scan are the best way to see bones. Okay, that's another different. In addition to the traditional MRI, we have the magnetic resonance angiography, the magnetic resonance spectrography or diffusion imaging. Uh, the magnetic resonance and geography is used to evaluate perfusion and blood vessel abnormalities such as arteria, blockage, 
uh, intracranial aneurysm and arteriovenous malformations. While the MRS is used to detect abnormalities in the brain, biochemical processes, such as which occurs in epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, and brain attack, which is known as strokes. And diffuse imaging uses MRI techniques to evaluate ischemia in the brain to determine the location and severity of the stroke, right? So MRI angiography, the uh, magnetic resonance spectrography, and then we have the diffuse imaging to assess and evaluate ischemia. Okay, now we have compute tomography, position emission tomography. This is a combination CT PET scanners, uh, and they use images together to produce detailed information about the type and location of neurologic dysfunctions. These are particularly used in a staging in brain, spinal cord, and other primary cancers. And these use um, a fluid called IV deoxygen glucose. And the way it works is that um, this um, fluid, okay, um, is going to highlight the different areas in which the cancer is present. So the cells, the cancerous cells are going to absorb, they are going to eat this intravenous fluid. And the more highlighted the area, the more presence of these cancerous cells uh, is. So um, basically this test is used to evaluate drug metabolism and detect areas of metabolic alteration that occurs in dementia, epilepsy, psychiatric and degenerative disorders, neoplasms, and Alzheimer's disease. The level of radiation is equivalent to that of five or six x-rays, but much less than exposure during CT. So the amount of, of radiation in CT PET, PET is bigger, uh, it's six times um, the amount of a regular CT. Teach patients that they will be MPO the night before morning test and four hours before afternoon testing. So the night before and four hours before afternoon testing. Patients with diabetes have their test in the morning before taking their anti-diabetic medication. So the patient with diabetes is going to be MPO the previous night and also nothing per mouth four hours before the test and they, are, they have to hold on their diabetic medications. During these two to three hours procedure, the patient may be blindfolded and have ear plaques inserted for all or part of the test. Patients are asked to perform certain mental functions to activate different areas of the brain. Older adults and patients with mental health, behavioral health problems may, may be too anxious to have a CT PET scan. So the nurses and the team, they have to work um, relax the patient. Single photon emission computer, computed tomography. This is the SPECT, uses a radio pharmaceutical agent to enable uh, radioisotopes to cross the blood brain barrier. The agent is administered by IV injection, so this is not this is this is a no yoke test. They are crossing your blood brain barrier. Um, it's useful in studying cerebral blood flow, neoplasm, which is new um, tumors, okay, new tumors, head trauma or persistent vegetative state. The test is contraindicated in women who are breastfeeding, of course. Uh, magnetoencephalography um, is a non-invasive imaging technique used to measure the magnetic fields produced by electrical activity in the brain be extremely 
sensitive devices make it somewhat similar to electro and electroencephalography EEG. So I am um, reviewing all the tests as your PowerPoint requires. However, I am putting more effort and I am putting information and alerts on the ones that I've seen the most in NCLEX and the ones that are coming in exam one. Cerebria, cerebral angiography. This may be done to visualize the cerebral circulation to detect blockages in the arteries or veins in the brain, head or neck that impair perfusion. So when we are talking about the neck, we are talking about the carotid, right? As we saw in the video of the circulation of the brain. It remains the gold standard for the diagnosis of intracranial vascular disease. Again, it remains the gold standard for the diagnosis of intracranial vascular disease and is required for, for any transcatheter therapy or for surgical intervention. And angiography may be used to identify aneurysm, traumatic injuries, strictures, occlusions, tumors, blood vessel displacements from edema, and AV malformations, edema, inflammation, fluid, fluid around the tissue. So let's see how the cerebral angiogram is done okay let's watch this video what is a diagnostic cerebral angiogram a diagnostic cerebral angiogram is a medical procedure that helps specialized doctors examine the blood vessels in the head and neck including the brain these doctors are able to examine blood vessels using high-tech imaging equipment to take x-ray pictures. What to expect during your angiogram? The procedure will take place in a room like this called the neuroangiography suite. It was designed specifically to perform procedures like yours. You'll lie down here with plenty of cushioning to keep you comfortable while the procedure is done. Your procedure will be performed under sedation. This means that your nurse will give you a combination of medications that will help you relax and remove any uncomfortable sensations. In addition to the sedation medications, the doctor will also apply numbing medicine to your groin to ease any discomfort in that area. A small tube called a catheter will then be inserted into an artery in your leg called the femoral artery. You may feel some pressure as the catheter is being placed. The femoral artery gives the doctor a direct pathway to the vessels of the head and neck without crossing or coming close to the heart. How is a cerebral angiogram performed? The imaging equipment in the neuroangiography suite uses x-rays to help the doctors guide the catheter to the vessel they want to see. When it is time to take the x-ray pictures of the blood vessels, a contrast medium, or dye, is injected into the vessel through the catheter. This typically produces a warm but not painful feeling that lasts for a few seconds. The imaging equipment may rotate around your head. You may also hear beeping noises as the pictures are taken. These noises help to signal your doctor about the position of the equipment. The x-ray pictures are displayed on screens that the doctors watch as they are performing the procedure. The doctor will look at the pictures more closely once your procedure is finished. What happens after the procedure? At the end of the procedure, the catheter is removed and a closure device is used to seal the site. In selected situations, the doctor holds pressure at that site for 15 to 20 minutes. A band-aid is then applied. 
You will stay here in the recovery room for five to six hours after the procedure. Thank you very much for watching. Thank Again, you. Thank you please so don't much. Thank you so much. And thank you to John Hopkins for this excellent video. So you know how the procedure is done, the preparation and the post care after uh, the angiography, right? So you have to ensure that the patient is MPO for to six hours before the test, assess and document neurologic signs, vital signs and neurovascular checks. Um, your head is going to be immobilized. Do not move during the procedure. These are the indications to the patient. Your contrast diet is injected through the catheter placed in the femoral artery. When we mention femoral artery, we have to identify this artery as a high alert care. Patient bleeding from the femoral could, could die. Uh, you will be able to talk to healthcare professionals during the procedure. Uh, let them know if you are in pain or have any concerns, even though the patient is going to receive some anesthetic. Okay, so the procedure, please see the video, watch the video. So the best practice for patient safety and quality care precautions for use of contrast for neurologic diagnostic testing, it's all about kidney protection, all about kidney protection for this particular test. So you have to follow agency guidelines regarding informed consent. You have uh, to, you ask the patient about allergies, food, drug, envir environmental, asthma, or prior reaction to contrast agent. Review for the presence of these conditions, talking about the contrast agent, you need to make sure that the patient is going to understand that hydration is important for them in order to um, get rid of the contrast. Hydration post-procedure is very important to get rid of the contrast and to protect the kidney. I cannot repeat this enough, okay? Review for the presence of these conditions, pre-existing renal disease, such a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, diabetic nephropathy, nephrons, kidneys, heart failure. Remember the kidneys, the heart, and the lungs are the best friends in our body. They work together. They protect each other, okay? But in this particular procedure, kidneys and heart, right? If you are not able to urinate, you are going to accumulate fluids causing congestive heart failure. Then dehydration, you need to assess for dehydration. The patient must be hydrated and must be able to have a good kidney function. Um, check if the patient is in their older age and we know the metabolism usually decreases during this period. Drugs that interfere with renal perfusion such as metformin or NSAIDs. So that's why they are going to ask you if you are taking metformin and they are going to ask you to stop the intake of metformin, not only for the day of the procedure, but also for I think it's between some protocols are I'll tell in three days before the procedure, some other, some extra days, but also the answers to hold on that. Okay. Administration of contrast media in the previous 72 hours. They're going to ask you if you had any other procedures before this one, 72 hours um, ago. So it's all about kidney protection. Evaluating current kidney function patients with a serum creatinine greater than or equal to 1.5 mg or a calculated glomerular filtration or of less than 60. So now you need to go and review what is your regular creatinine and what are the stages of the kidney problems, especially those related to the amount and the levels of GFR, glomerular 
filtration rate, right? Because patients that are having less than 60 ml per minute are at higher risk for kidney damage from contrast media. Again, cerebral angiography and nursing care must be focused on kidney protection. Uh, hold drugs that are associated with kidney damage for 24 to 48 hours before and after the test, providing uh, adequate hydration before and after contrast administration, reevaluated serum creatinine and glomerular filtrate, of course, after the procedure, and um, sometimes just to schedule the cerebral angiography. They are going to ask you if you are in host um, in inpatient uh, setting. They are not asking you no documentation, no blood work because the hospital, in the moment of of admission, they are going to do all the procedures. But if you are coming from outpatient, what is going to happen is they are going to ask you for the last CMP, uh, the comprehensive metabolic panel. Um, to see how your kidney function is, is doing. And with that in hand, they will schedule um, the procedure after they verify the creatinine and the glomerular filtration. Follow-up care. Follow agency policy regarding nursing care of the injection entry site, which may include the following. Check the dressing for bleeding and swelling around the site. Apply an ice pack to the side, keep extremities straight and immobilized, and that's good to know. This is NCLEX material, and maintain the pressure dressing for two hours. So two things that I want you to remember in relation with cerebral angiography is your kidney protection and all the facts around that pre and post procedure, and also your bleeding precautions. Um, at the site of the insertion of the IV in the femoral, okay? So that, um, that includes the dressing for bleeding, the ice pack to keep the extremity straight and um, maintain the pressure dressing for two hours. And that's good to know. Also, you need to check the extremity for adequate circulation uh, to include a Skin color and temperature pulses, pulses, pulses distal to the injection site and capillary refill. We explained that we are going to um, assess for peripheral function, peripheral circulation with the capillary refill, with your um, O2SAT, your PALOR, your skin temperature, but basically here they are asking you for pulses, monitor your blood pressure. If you lose, um, if you are bleeding, blood pressure is going to drop, um, pulse frequently for indications of internal bleeding. So if your blood pressure is dropped, you are going to start developing tachycardia palpitations. If bleeding occurs, the client blood pressure will decrease and the pulse will increase. Okay, what I'm saying, the pulse, tachycardia palpitation. Uh, read, please, the critical rescue. And then we have the electromyography is used to identify nerve and muscle disorders as well as spinal cord disease. During the electromyography, recording electrodes are placed into skeletal muscle to monitor their electrical activity. That's why it's called electromyography. Electro is electrical, bio refers to muscles, graphy is the imaging, okay? You need to start studying this way, breaking down the words into pieces to understand the suffix and the prefix of every word so you get familiarized right, uh, with the procedures. A progressive increase in the amplitude of the electric waveform is a classic sign of several neuromuscular diseases such as myasthenia gravis, which we are going to check further in these chapters related to neuro um, nervous systems, to the nervous system disorders. Myasthenia gravis is a rare progressive autoimmune disease characterized by muscle weakness as a result of impaired acetylcholine receptor. Myasthenia muscle weakness, MM, myasthenia muscle weakness, okay? Electro 
encephalography records the electrical activity of the cerebral hemispheres electro electrical encephalo related to the brain graphy okay Electroencephalography, encephalography, electrical activity of the cerebral hemispheres. We have the right and the left, right? And the right controls the left side of the body and the left uh, hemisphere controls the right side of the body. Certain illnesses or health problems can cause changes in brain wave. For example, a cerebral tumor or infarct may have abnormally slow wave forms. Fasting is avoided before EEG testing because that's good to know. Hello, hello. Fasting is avoided because EEG testing can cause hypoglycemia and can alter the test results. With this being said, please, critical thinking, analyze the extent of the glucose activity in the brain. If you don't eat a certain amount of carbohydrates, your electrical activity is going to be diminished or altered okay especially this is especially in diabetic patients when patients are under normal health conditions non-diabetic these balances are created by the body itself the body is able to compensate but when you are diabetic and you don't get your carbohydrates, your electrical activity is going to be diminished. In the opposite side, if you eat too much glucose, too much carbohydrate, also your electrical activity in the brain is going to be compromised. Please understand this. But for this particular exam, you cannot present to the clinic or the hospital in a fasting state. You have to eat something before the procedure, okay? Um, here is the picture, how the encephal electroencephalogram is done. And then you have evoked potentials. P please feel free to read this on your own. And then we have another important test, which is the lumbar puncture. That's good to know. NCLEX material alert. So for ankle exam from my exam one, lumbar puncture, spinal tap is the insertion of a spinal needle into the subarachnoid space, which we analyze in the first part of this uh, nervous system assessment. We saw a video on that between the third and the fourth, sometimes the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae. So we remember we have the spinal cords, has the cervical area, which is eight cervical um, um, uh, nerves. Then we have the thoracic, which is 12. Then we have the lumbar and then we have the sacral. So this is done between the third and the fourth, sometimes the fourth and the fifth lumbar vertebrae and is used to obtain cerebrospinal fluid pressure readings with a manometer, obtain the fluid for analysis, check for spinal blockage caused by a spinal cord lesion, or inject contrast medium or air for diagnostic study, inject selected drugs. Because of the danger of sudden release of the spinal core, uh, spinal um, fluid pressure, okay, because of that, because of the sudden release of the cerebrospinal fluid pressure, and lumbar puncture, lumbar puncture is not done for patients with symptoms indicating severely increased intracranial pressure. So you don't do that test in patients with increased intracranial pressure. The procedure is also not performed in patients with skin infections at or near the puncture site because of the danger of introducing 
infective organism. What infection could be in the skin around that area? For example, a typical one is herpes, okay, which is presented in the in the back, right? And in the areas of the dermatons, which are not included. The dermatons are not included in this uh, edition of Ignatavicius versus the 10, the 10 edition includes the dermatons, okay? The, this 11 is not. So this is NCLEX material. You must master this, okay? Aware, be aware with the skin infections around the site in which the lumbar puncture is going to be done. In preparation for the procedure, position the patient in a fetal sideline position to separate the vertebrae and move the spinal nerve roots away from the area to be accessed. Another that's good to know, NCLEX alert, obtain vital signs and perform frequent neurologic checks as directed by agency protocol. Follow agency protocols, how long the patient should be on bed rest and remain flat. Encourage the patient to increase fluid intake and less contraindicated. Monitor for complications, especially increase intracranial pressure. Professor, what are the symptoms of intracranial pressure? So you have severe headache, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, and change in level of consciousness. Okay, serious complications, although are not very common, include brain stem herniation, okay, or infections. Professor, how can I assess for infection after this procedure? Check for redness, warm to touch, the skin around uh, that where the side where the puncture was done, if the patient is having fever, for example. Now, uh, cerebrospinal fluid leakage and hematoma formation. Okay, this is not common, but you have to check everything. Observe the needle insertion site for leakage and notify the primary healthcare provider if this occurs. Okay, this is good to know. Eglex alert. And then you can get familiarized where, with your, e, your, your transcranial Doppler ultrasonography. Okay, and that's... Oh, that completes all the imaging part of this chapter um, name, assessment of the nervous system. I'm so tired already. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you. We completed this and we will come back with more videos. Enjoy your studying.